Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today, we visit with two guests who know firsthand what it's like to help people they care about face circumstances that are too tough for them to face alone. Author and speaker Kay Warren and UFC fighter Cody Garbrandt. First up, Kay Warren is the co-founder of Saddleback Church with her husband, Rick. She is an international speaker, best-selling author, and Bible teacher who has a passion for inspiring and motivating others to make a difference with their lives. She is best known for more than 10 years as a tireless advocate for those living with mental illness. Today, she shares about growing up in the church, how she and her husband, Rick, met, and the beginnings of Saddleback Church plus her fight for her son's life as he dealt with mental illness, which first started when he was very young. I'm Kay Warren, and my husband Rick and I founded Saddleback Church in our living room in 1980, and so we've been serving at Saddleback for about 38 years. Currently, I'm an advocate for people living with mental illness and for those affected by suicide. I was born in San Diego, California. My dad was a pastor of small Southern Baptist churches, very conservative little churches where um, I think one of the things I remember about growing up, growing up was not being able to play cards, not going to movies, not going to dances, not being able to wear a two-piece swimsuit. I mean, really super conservative uh, childhood, but it was good. I loved what my dad did. My mom and dad um, were people of integrity, and they lived the same life at home that they did at church. I was a very typical church pastor's daughter at the time, playing the piano, singing in the choir. I knew how to sew. I knew how to cook. Um, some things that were very much expected of, of women and girls uh, when I was growing up. I loved nature, loved being outside, but I was more of a passive enjoyer of, of nature. I, I wasn't the kind of person that had to conquer the ski slopes and you know plumb the depths of the ocean. I was content to sit on a blanket and look up at the stars. That was my enjoyment. Or watch a tree or flower. I'm much more an enjoyer of nature than a participator in nature, but beauty restores me. So growing up in a ministry family was not problematic for me. I I didn't I didn't sense that um, that we were different at church than we were at home. We had our secrets, um, and those were things that came to play out in my life later on, but I didn't recognize it as a little kid as being things that were different. Rick and I met at college, this little liberal arts college where we were both students, and there were only about 600 students at the time, so you knew everybody, and I knew of Rick, and I knew that every weekend he was out preaching at some youth revival, and I thought he was wonderful. He was funny and outgoing and um, very extroverted, but I was not interested in him because he was too loud, um, he was too extroverted, and I could never, I was not seriously interested in him. I just liked him as a friend. And um, I was dating one of his friends at the time, and I asked him why Rick didn't date. He was popular. Clearly, everybody liked him, but he just, he didn't date. And I asked his friend, you know, why doesn't Rick date? And he said, well, he figures why waste the money on a girl you're not going to marry? You know, that when the right girl comes along, got to let him know that, and that'll be that. And I just thought that was the strangest thing I'd ever heard of. A few months later, this this guy that I'd been dating, who was Rick's friend, we broke up. And, and within, felt like a few days, all of a sudden, Rick was sitting down next to me in the cafeteria, and we didn't really know each other. Um, he took me out on a date, and eight days later, he asked me to marry him. And I remember it as being one of those moments in which there's only been a couple times in my life where I really felt like God spoke to me, and this was one of those moments. And uh, Rick said after this date, eight days after our first date, would you marry me? And I said, what did you say? And he said, I, I love you. Would you marry me? And I prayed and I said, God, what am I, what am I supposed to do? I don't love him. I'm not in love with him. What am I supposed to say? And this is where I felt God spoke to me. I felt like he said, say yes, and I'll bring the feelings. And so with my 19 year old um, understanding of God and his will and love and marriage and all those things, I said yes even though I didn't love him. 
because I felt God had told me to do that. So soon after that, he went to Japan on a short-term mission trip. I went to Alabama as a short-term mission trip. We came back together. I ended up moving back home where my parents lived. So we were separated the entire year before we got married. So when I think back of what were the problems, what led us to the terrible marriage problems that we encountered right off the bat was, first of all, we didn't know each other. We, we just genuinely didn't know each other. We didn't go through the typical courtship of where you, you see each other day in and day out. It was, we were strangers. So that created a few problems. There was a problem because I had been sexually molested when I was a little girl, but I hadn't told anybody. and I. I had never even really thought that much. It was something that kind of got buried in my own mind. And um, and so when we got married and I mentioned it to Rick, um, he didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know what to do with that, but it created a lot of problems. And then I think looking back also is we were just very immature, very immature. We didn't have a lot of experience. We hadn't, um, it wasn't in a day and time in which you talk a lot about uh, problems and how to work them through. And so within days of getting married, we were both instantly thinking, this is the biggest mistake I have ever made in my life. And um, so for the next few years, just struggled constantly with conflict and how to communicate, how to work through all the things that you're supposed to work through, you know, before you get married. So today, after being married in nearly 43 years, I can tell you that we are best friends and we are crazy about each other and madly in love, but it took a long time to, to work through all the things that were wrong, all the things that we had to overcome, all the ways that were so different, but um, I'm so glad we did. I am so glad we did. After we graduated from college, Rick wanted to go to seminary. So we moved from California to Texas and he went to Southwestern Seminary and um, while we were there, his whole vision changed. I was not happy with the fact that his vision changed because I married a guy that I thought was gonna be a traditional pastor. It's just what I thought was gonna happen. I knew he was going into ministry and that was okay. But once we got to seminary, he felt like that God was asking him to plant a church. Today, that's just not that big a deal. It just feels like everybody you talk to is planning a church or they've done church planting, but it was, it was not common, um, you know, 40, three years ago, but to just start from scratch with no money, no members, no building, uh, none of that didn't feel exciting to me. It was actually it felt pretty scary. So I was a little resistant at first. And, um, and then as God began to work in my heart, which is a longer story, but as he began to work in my heart and slowly the dream moved from just Rick's heart to, to mine as well. So that when we actually moved to the Saddleback Valley in 1980, I was as as excited as he was. I couldn't wait. I just, I was ready. I believed in what God had called him to do. I believed in Rick and his gifts and this, um, what God was doing. And I was ready. So Easter 1980 was our first service. And it was so exciting. Uh, this, we didn't know how many people would show up. We had this little band of people who'd been working with us for, you know, like 10 weeks getting ready, but we had no idea. And that first day at Laguna Hills High School, um, when 205 people came walking in person after person, I, 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 it's, it still makes me really emotional. Um, it was like, God, you're, you really did call us to this. This is, this is what we're supposed to do. And this thing is going to work. There are 205 people here. And, uh, it just, it went from there and it, it blossomed and it mushroomed and it, grew exponentially. And um, we just felt like we were on the, the back of a bucking bronco, just kind of holding on for dear life because this church exploded and people came to know Christ by the dozens and then the hundreds and then the thousands. And over these years, it, it has been one of the greatest joys of my life is to, is to lead and, and pastor and minister to and shepherd, be a shepherd to the people here at Saddleback Church. It just grew through stages. And we found that we had to keep growing. We, we couldn't stay the same people that we were when we started the church. That, that as leaders, we had to constantly be evolving, constantly be growing in our own character, in our own capacity to, to know God and then to communicate um, Him to the people that, that we were serving. 
And um, as that visibility grew, Rick, being an extrovert, was just naturally more comfortable with that than me as an introvert. And I've, I've had to go through a lot of different um, growth periods in which I would just have to keep surrendering to God. And then as those numbers would grow, I would have to just keep coming back to God and say, I don't know how to do this. This is beyond me. This is beyond my capability. This is far beyond what I feel like I can do. The good part about that was that it, it made me trust God. It made me rely on him. It made me um, believe that that I was capable for whatever he had called me to do. Philippians 4.13 in the Amplified says, I am ready for and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. That is, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. That verse has, has really held me as the church has grown in visibility and grown in responsibility. It's that through what God, what Jesus has infused in me, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I really am able to do it. I'm equal to it. I'm up for it because of his strength in me. And it's pushed me in ways that I don't know that I would have been pushed had we stayed at 50 or 100. It's The visibility has forced me to rely on God, forced me to grow, forced me to um, really lean into his capability to be capable. One of the greatest joys of my life has been being a mom. And uh, we have three kids, Amy, Josh, and Matthew. And um, Josh and Amy are just amazing human beings. They've got little people themselves now, so I'm a grandma. It's the best thing in the world. Um, but Matthew, our youngest, we knew from a really early age that he was different than his siblings. He was seven when we really realized that all those things that had just been different and that we thought he would grow out of were actually a problem. And um, so at seven, Matthew was diagnosed with, de with depression. And then from there, bless his heart, uh, you know, panic attacks and ADHD and early onset bipolar disorder and suicidal ideation when he was 12 and then obsessive compulsive disorder and body dysmorphic disorder and um, major depressive disorder. And, and then um, in the last year and a half before he passed away, he was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. So his life was so difficult uh, with so many challenges around mental illness and, and they just didn't get better. They just got worse and worse. And even though he, he was so ill, he was also this amazing guy. He was funny and creative and deeply compassionate for other people who suffer. He had a, a, a huge tender heart for other people in pain. And, um, but he, he just kept, it just kept getting worse. And probably a few years, probably two or three years before he died, I realized that as his mom, it was taking such a toll on me. Mental illness, especially severe mental illness, takes such a toll on families. And, um, and our family was struggling right along with him, suffering with him. And I knew that I was going down, if you will, going down spiritually, going down emotionally. So I did a really intense study of scripture and what the Bible says about joy and came to realize that I had defined it wrong. I was I was defining it based on how I felt, how my emotions were. If I, if I felt up that day, if it seemed like it was a good day, then I could experience joy. But if Matthew had a hard day or something else went wrong in my life, then I didn't have joy. And that up and down, up and down was really getting to me. Come to find out as I look at scripture that it's so much more than that. That's why I wrote a book called Choose Joy because happiness isn't enough. Happiness will not carry you through those dark times. It will not be enough when the wheels fall off the bus, when, when the bottom falls out. Happiness will evaporate, but joy can stay, and that's what I wanted. And when I realized that joy was so much about what I knew about God, what I believed about God, the choices that I wanted to make in relation to what I knew about God changed everything for me. And it was in that study of joy and, and making a decision that I could count on God's character, that I could count on God's goodness, that I could count on God's control in my life, even when to me life was spiraling wildly out of control, that that's when joy began to take root in my life and that changed me. 
that changed my approach. So when Matthew declined, um, and he did decline, and eventually took his life on April 5th, 2013, it was the worst day of my life. It was the day that I had dreaded, prayed would never happen, and, and yet it did. Um, we felt very helpless to change the trajectory of the way it seemed like Matthew was going. And when he died, we were faced with um, confronting on the deepest level ever, what do we really believe about God? What do we really believe about uh, what he teaches? What is he truly good? I had I'd come to that conclusion um, when I was learning how to choose joy. But when we lost Matthew, there was nothing that had ever challenged my faith to that. And um, we did lose, I in particular, lost hope for a while after he died. My hope had been that God would heal him, and God didn't heal him in the way that I expected, the way that I fervently prayed, begged, pleaded with God, counted on verses, counted on um, scripture. That isn't what happened. But you can't live without hope. And so I had to learn how to rebuild hope, how to rebuild that trust in God and his promises. When Matthew died and we were left with shattered lives, shattered hope, shattered family, um, and we made the decision just really right off the bat that we were going to try to help other people, um, God has been has just brought hundreds, hundreds of other people into our lives since then. Um, sometimes it's people who themselves are living with suicidal thoughts and, and are struggling, uh, can't, they're not sure that they're going to be able to make it. Sometimes it's families who have a loved one who is also feeling suicidal. And sometimes it's families who have lost someone to suicide. And they're just, as we were in that shattered heap on the floor of trying to figure out how do you rebuild your life? And, um, while it's been difficult to share over and over and over and over our journey and our journey in grief and our journey in rebuilding hope, it it gives me the sense that Matthew's death is not wasted. And I remember so many times in the first weeks and months just saying, my life is ruined. It will never be good again. It can never be good. And what I would say to anybody who has experienced grief and loss and that sense that you have that your life is ruined and it can never be good again. I will tell you that life will never be the same again. That part is for certain. It will never be the same, but it can be good again. And God has this way of still working in those places where we feel ruined, where we feel like our lives have been shattered, and he does rebuild. So if you're struggling today with um, mental illness, or maybe you're not even sure that that's what's wrong, you just know you're having a harder time functioning at work or in your maintaining your friendships or um, there's just you can't sometimes you might not be able to get out of bed you're, you're feeling life just feels like it's collapsed in on you and you're not sure that you can keep going I just want you to know you're not alone and that there is hope and please don't isolate yourself it's 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 a natural thing that we do when we're feeling sad or feeling alone or feeling anxious is to isolate and to withdraw and not be as close to other people. Sometimes that's because we don't really want them to know. We're afraid that they won't love us or that they will think we're weird if we tell them how much we're struggling. But that just increases that sense of anxiety and that sense of loneliness and that sense of depression. So the very first thing I would do is to tell you, please connect with other people in your life who love you. And if you are a family member, someone you love um, uh, is either maybe they don't recognize that they have an illness or they are just so ill that they can't seek the help that they, maybe you have love somebody who has a substance use disorder. I mean, there's so many things that get complicated in there. Reach out. Do not stay isolated. Seek help at, at your church. Um, there's some great organizations, NAMI, the National Alliance of, of, um, of Mental Illness, is a great free resource so you can get tons of information. My website, kwarren.com, has all kinds of things that I've assembled that I didn't know how to find when I was had a family member, but we've assembled them and they're easy and they're easy to access. So don't be alone, don't give up hope, and look for the resources and the help because there's always hope. 
McKay believes that we don't always have to understand God in order to trust Him, and that we can trust Him because He loves us. She finds comfort in the words of Jesus Calling and encourages those who are dealing with pain and loss to remember that God's love for us never changes, even when things get hard. I don't even remember when I first encountered Jesus Calling. It just feels like it's so much a part of my life, and it's been so much a part of my life for so long now that I tried to think when I first heard about it, when somebody first gave me the cup. I, I don't know. But um, I love it. It has been... Um, just sometimes the exact word I needed. I, I think that part of what's been so meaningful is because it's personalized. It comes from it's as though Jesus himself is talking to me. And that has felt very intimate. It's, it's like, yes, this is you, Jesus, talking to me from your word. And um, I've relied on it in some difficult situations. Uh, it's on my phone. I carry it, you know, I've got the app. And so I, I, if I don't read it at home, I'm reading it on my app. But there's a passage, uh, one day's reading in particular, I go back to over and over and over. And it says, I am leading you step by step through your life. Hold my hand in trusting dependence, letting me guide you through this day. Your future looks uncertain and feels flimsy, even precarious. This is is how it should be. Secret things belong to the Lord, and future things are secret things. When you try to figure out the future, you are grasping at things that are mine. This, like all forms of worry, is an act of rebellion, doubting my promise to care for you. Whenever you find yourself worrying about the future, repent and return to me I will show you the next step forward, and the one after that, and the one after that. Relax and enjoy the journey in my presence, trusting me to open up the way before you as you go. The day I read that for the very first time was a day I was worried about Matthew. I didn't know what was going to happen. He was in a particularly bad season, and I wanted to know what the future held. And when I read that that morning, and it says, that this day your future feels uncertain and flimsy. I'm like, yes, 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 it does. Even precarious, yes, that's exactly. And then that line, that's how it should be? That secret things belong to the Lord and future things are secret things? You know, it was, it was a gentle word from Jesus, but it was also a little, hey, get out of there, that's my business. <laughs> this is not your business, this is mine. And then when it says, when you try to figure it out, you're grasping at things in our mind, and that is a form of rebellion? You're doubting that I'm gonna care for you? Whoa. So it convicts me and comforts me all at once. My life is anchored on the belief that God can be trusted. I don't understand why Matthew had mental illness so severe from a little boy, from being a little, I don't understand that. I don't understand why we couldn't get all the help that we needed. I don't understand why he wasn't healed. I don't know. What I do know is that God holds those answers, and I'm content to let God hold those answers. I know He will tell me, and I know that one day I will see Matthew again. Um, soon after he died, somebody came up to me, and one of my dearest friends, and her greeting to me was, the next time you see him, he'll come running to you whole and in his right mind. I believe that. I absolutely believe that because of what I know about God. I know how He works. I don't get His ways, but I know His love for me never changes. And that one day, all that He has promised, I will receive. For more information about Kay Warren and her book, Choose Joy Because Happiness Isn't Enough, please visit kaywarren.com. We'll be right back after this brief message about a free offer from Jesus Calling. Are you looking for a way to keep track of your daily prayers along with Jesus Calling? The Jesus Calling Family Prayer Calendar goes right along with your daily readings from Jesus Calling. Each day begins with a guided reflection, followed by a space for you to fill in your prayers of thanksgiving and special requests. You can get your free Jesus Calling Family Prayer Calendar by visiting jesuscalling.com offers. Visit JesusCalling.com slash offers to download your free family prayer calendar today. Our 
next guest is UFC world champion fighter, Cody Garbrandt. When Cody was a young boy, he dreamed of becoming a champion. His family was filled with generations of fighters, and while growing up in a blue-collar town in central Ohio, his dream to become a champion seemed nearly impossible. After years of struggle, when Cody was 20, his brother introduced him to someone who would change Cody's life forever. My name is Cody Garbrandt. I'm a former and future UFC Bantamweight champion uh, from Sacramento, California. As early back in my childhood as I remember is my mom always being there for us. I had an older brother that was 11 months older than me named Zach. Uh, I always remember just wrestling around with him. My father was non-existent. He was never really in our life. He was in and out of prison since we were you know, born. And uh, we actually took our mother maiden name, Garbrandt. Growing up in Yerkesville and Denison, Ohio was, you know, much different from a lot of places. You know, it's uh, a lot of factories were outsourced, jobs were taken away. There's there's a coal mine in town. There's a couple of factories that, you know, a lot of the our family or our mothers or parents, our cousins, our uncles worked at. Uh, so it was kind of a really small town. Everybody knows everybody. Um, we come from a low poverty, you know, uh, stricken community. But I just remember just a lot of blue collar people, you know, and hard workers um, and just, just love growing up in a small town like that. And, uh, you know, when, when things happen, big things or bad things, you know, the community came together. And uh, it's kind of like those, those Friday night football, football games or Friday night lights kind of town. And except for reverse role, it was wrestling. We had a good wrestling population, a good wrestling team. So the community really supported our wrestling, uh, our school. My family grew up fighting and in sometimes negative environments, but sometimes in, in controlled environments as well. Like my uncle was an amateur boxer, my grandfather boxed, my father boxed, my other uncle boxed. It was just, we were in a fighting family and that's where it came from. And uh, that's all I knew was fighting at an early age. I was around it, I was, went to the fights. My grandfather took us to our uncle's fights and he would get so drunk and, and there that he ended up fighting in the stands and we'd watch our grandpa be fighting in the stands with some other spectator or some other you know person that was there. and. We we watch him fight and watch our uncle fight and then we'd go home. So it was just a uh, just a no normal for us. As far as back I remember, I wanted to be a fighter. Like I said, I've always had fighting around my life, whether it was negative or positive, and I took the positive from it. You know, my faith my faith base or being faith driven has, you know, from my uncle. Like I said, he was uh, tried as adult, uh, 15 years old, life sentence. Uh, was incarcerated, was acquitted of charges 23 months later. And he's the one that kind of led us to God or led us to going to church and having a relationship with the Lord. Um, he had epiphany in there and he tells us all about it. Um, you know, how he felt you know, a, a pressure come off his chest and you know, he gave himself to the Lord there and he would encourage us to go to church. He would pick us up and we'd go to church and spend Sunday, Sunday morning before we even knew who the Lord was. Um, I'd always talk to someone as a child, you know, and you're in your head. And so I always had that belief in a higher power until it come to the realization that was the Lord, that was God that I was talking to. And then I found a new church in uh, Sugar Creek, Ohio, called New Point Church. And it was a, a church that I went to uh, early, in my early, early adult um, life um, from a teenager to till present day. I still try to attend when I'm in Ohio. But there's a lot of churches that I bounced around in um, when I was in high school. I kind of just started going on my own and wanting to have a relationship with the Lord when um, you know, I was going through things and I could always fall back on Him. And I always knew that when I went to the church services, no matter where I was at in my life, I always felt like the Lord was speaking to me and I, could, I took something from that service and, and what the message was to be shared with. And I just always felt that I was changed, challenged, and renewed after a good church service and I just, you know, kept growing my relationship with the Lord. My uncle was our father figure in our life once he got out of prison. He was a former amateur boxer and continued his career once he was uh, released from prison. He would take us to the gym, take us to restaurants, to dinner, to lunches. It would, you know, take us school shopping, fishing, whatever you, whatever you can, he could do with us to spend time with us. You know, I always remember wanting to be like my uncle. I got to be about 11 or 12 years old and I saw the UFC, Ultimate Fighting Championship on TV. And I wrestled at the time as well. So, and I also boxed without my mom knowing. My uncle would sneak us off to the gym, we'd spar and we'd hit pads. My mom wasn't too fond of us, you know, boxing and the fear of being punch drunk and other things that, you know, a mother would worry about. 
So my uncle would take us to the gym, we'd spar and train secretly. And so, you know, it was just inevitable that we would want to do this, follow in his footsteps. And there was a show on Spike TV, it was called The Ultimate Fighter, where a lot of, about 16 contestants would live in a house and they would fight each other for a contract to the UFC to make it to the UFC. I remember watching that show and visualizing myself being on there, getting, getting on the show and winning the UFC contract and becoming a UFC star and, and champion. And uh, I've always had that dream of, of being a world champion. I always believed in myself too. I always believed in, you know, that I would make it to the UFC and I would be a world champion. I always had that, that faith in myself and I dreamed so big that I knew that, you know, I had the, the courage to chase it. You know, that God placed that dream in my heart. No matter what I was going through, even my darkest times as I grew up, it was in and out of trouble, out of fights or at parties, making wrong decisions. I always had that little flash of light at the end of the tunnel was being a world champion. And that's what I held on to uh, over the years and just chasing this dream and always believing in myself. So I've, I have a pretty you know, vigorous, uh, tough training schedule, but I love it because you have to train as hard as you're gonna fight. You know, if you train hard, then the fight will be easier. Training for me is day in and day out. It's a grind, I call it the grind. It's embracing the grind, embracing the pain. It's, you know, every day you get to get up and have your worth ethic judged. You get it, every day is a fresh day to, you know, have a new start, a new start in this in this life that you're working towards. And for me, it's a challenge. I have an upcoming fight. I have a you know a vision board. I have goals and dreams and everything written out before the camp that I have to achieve during my camp. From the smallest task of getting up early, making sure I'm everything's in order before I get to the gym. I'm there early, I'm doing from the smallest thing from my stretching to my mobility. As much as physical work you put in it, you also have to do the mental side of it. I also go to float therapy, it's a de deprivation tank. You go in there, I lay in there for an hour and kind of just get lost with myself and you float on top of the Epsom salt and, and you know I go into this dream state and just visualize and I usually do pr my prayer. I speak to the Lord and whatever thoughts and and feelings come into me, I just let it go and, and get attached with myself uh, mentally, physically, spiritually in the float tanks. Cody trained hard to become the world champion fighter he always wanted to be. He experienced some setbacks as a young adult, making decisions he wasn't proud of and grew frustrated with the long road to the UFC. However, his inspiration to keep going came from an unlikely young friend. I met Maddox Maple. He's a five-year-old boy from the same hometown as I was and he was diagnosed with leukemia. My brother reached out to me and I was an amateur fighter trying to make my ranks up to the pro and trying to make this as a career. And I had a lot of adversity and wrong decisions and bad decisions that I made that was delaying me from the road that I should have been on. And we met at unfortunate circumstances, you know, with his early diagnosis with leukemia and his battle and what I was going through, I was trying to get back on, on in the gym and back to my passion, back to my dream that I wanted to be a world champion for so long. And like I said, I kept making horrible decisions and just kind of living carelessly, uh, you know, and until I met Maddox Maple and he kind of changed my life. You know, he redirected my faith, my focus, my purpose in life uh, after meeting him and sitting down with his family. Uh, the first time meeting him, I left there and I knew that I had more to live than how I was living life. It gave me more purpose in, in, in my fighting career. And, you know, it was a bond that we, we made and I would always come and see him. He would walk me out to my fights from amateur all up to the pro. And I had so much motivation and, and, and inspiration from him through the battle that he fought every day to get up and just fight for his life. A five-year-old kid found the inner strength to be able to do that. And it really helped me in my career to go and push myself in the practice and go in there and fight and keep fighting and getting this experience so I can go to the pro, I can go to the UFC and become a world champion. And I really leaned on him a lot for uh, motivation, inspiration when I needed it the most. And it was about seven months left of him taking his chemotherapy and he wanted to give up, he wanted to die. He didn't want to do it anymore. His parents called me. They called me and said that they needed, they needed that, my help. They needed uh, you know, someone to get their little boy's heart turned around and they knew that it could be me. He looked up to me so much. and. So it was, a, it was a, you know, a phone call that really made my heart sink. You know, this was a boy that turned into my little brother. I was, you know, didn't know what I was going to say to him. What, what could I do to change his little heart? I said, you know, Maddox, if you don't take this medicine, you're going to die. 
And I said, who's going to walk me out to the octagon? Who's going to walk me out to these fights? I said, I don't go to battle alone, and you don't go to battle alone, you know? I need you there, and I love having you there. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you this promise. You don't complain about taking your medicine to your parents, or if, if you have seven months left, you've been doing so well. You promise me that you will take your medicine without complaining, and you'll beat cancer. I promise you I'll make it to the UFC, and I'll take you to every fight with me, and we'll win the world title together. And, you know, he took a big, deep breath, and he said, okay, Cody, I promise you that. You know, and we obviously kept in touch, obviously, and every time I'd come back to Ohio, I'd see him, and, you know, he, seven months later, he was still, you know, took his chemo. On August 25th, he called me, and he said, Cody, I said, what's going on, buddy? And he had a smile ear to ear. I mean, as happy as can be. And he said, I kept my end of the promise. Now it's your turn to keep your end of the promise. You know, I, I'm... I'm done with my chemo treatments. I'm in remission now. And at that time in my life, it really, really lit a fire under me. I was really so motivated and focused. I was out to Sacramento. I was 4-0 as a pro. I was so close to getting into the UFC. I was knocking on the door. And I just needed a, a little bit of a boost of, you know, inspiration and motivation from him. And that's what it was. I finally got signed to the UFC three months after he was in, uh, you know, in remission. You know, kind of was a series of events that was huge for us in our life. We finally got there and ended up making, you know, keeping my promise, making it to the UFC. And uh, he was there, and my first UFC fight, I ended up knocking my opponent out. And I was, you know, he was in section 216. I said, there's a little boy, and I got to give him a shout-out. And he was so happy. And the security guards let him come down the MGM in Las Vegas and give me a big hug. And he had tears in his eyes. He was so happy for me. And uh, that, was a, that was a great moment, and that was just the start. You know, I said, this is just a start. We're in now, and now we're going to go to the top, and we're going gonna, gonna, we're gonna to do this. We're going to set out to be a world champions together. And through the course of the years, it took us two years, a little under two years, uh, to reach our goal of becoming a world champion. And uh, on December 30th, 2016, I was able to keep and fulfill my promise with Maddox that we made and become a world champion together. I think that everyone... Uh, has the power to become a role model. I was in no position at the time to become a role model. Um, it kind of just, just happened naturally. I kind of was led into a leadership role. I remember being chosen as a team captain on my football team and wrestling team. And I remember telling the coach that I was no captain. I wasn't a team captain. I kind of did my own thing. And, you know, and, you know, coming and meeting Maddox and everyone saying, you're, you're a hero, you're a role model to this kid. I looked at it in, in a different light. He was an inspiration, almost a role model to me, but that molded me into being a role model for him and you know, the stuff that we went through. I think that if someone was wanting to be a role model, I think everyone has the power to be the role model, just doing the smallest things right from the smallest things, keeping the focus, keeping the dream, keeping the faith, no matter where you're at in your life, your highest of highs and your lowest of lows, is keeping that balance and just staying, staying focused and, 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 and positivity. I mean, staying, staying positive through it all, I think is, uh, how you can be, any, anyone can be a role model if you have this the positivity and then you can spread that positivity to anybody, whatever they're going through in their life. Cody believes that God gives us the dreams that are in our hearts, and when we trust Him, He can bring good from our lives. He reiterates this point by sharing the May 10th devotion from Jesus Calling. Do not resist or run from the difficulties in your life. These problems are not random mistakes. They are hand-tailored blessings designed for you for benefit of growth. Embrace all the circumstances that I allow in your life, trusting me to bring good out of them. View problems as opportunities to rely more fully on me. When you start to feel stressed, let those feelings alert you to your need for me. Thus your needs become doorways to deep dependence on me and increasing intimacy between us. Although self-sufficiency is acclaimed in the world, reliance on me produces abundant living in my kingdom. Thank me for the difficulties in your life since they provide protection from me and self-reliance. Yeah, I think that uh, as a, that's a great message, um, you know, for whatever you're going through. And uh, I'm forever grateful for a lot of the, the losses or the setbacks or the delays that God gives me in my life because I learn from them, I grow from them um, in all levels of my life, you know, spiritually, physically, mentally. Uh, so... You know, I just know that God's willing to do, you know, great things in my life. I choose just to keep my faith, you know, through the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. 
You know, if, if the God gives you a dream and he allows you to dream and then he gives you the courage to chase it, do it. There's a reason why he planned those dreams in your mind and heart. The words of encouragement I would give to someone that's facing the fight of her life is just to never give up. It's all worth it in the end. You know, the pain that you go through, you know, the adversity, the, the, the hardships, the, the trials and tribulations, you know, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. You can learn more about Cody and Maddox's friendship in Cody's new book, The Pact, available wherever books are sold. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with Jack and Marsha Countryman. Jack has been involved in the Christian publishing industry for over 30 years with Marsha by his side and created the beloved God's Promises series of books. Jack and Marsha share how working hard and seeking God together has helped to keep their marriage strong for over 50 years. I found the secret to a marriage is to lift your partner up at all times. Listen to her. Respect her. Have no secrets from her because she is your helpmate and God has given her to you to bless your life. And she blesses me every day. Do you love hearing great stories of faith each week via the Jesus Calling podcast? We want to hear from you. If you haven't already subscribed to the Jesus Calling podcast, visit the Jesus Calling page at iTunes.com and hit the subscribe button. While you're there, we'd love for you to leave us a review and tell us how you feel about the show and what future guests you'd love to see. Your reviews and subscription help us share these stories of faith to more people who need the hope and encouragement of Jesus Calling. If you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.